recording. The following interview was conducted with Stephen Leininger for the Purdue University Library's Oral History Project. It took place on August 10th, 2015, and the interviewer is Sammy Morris. And we have with us in the room Diane Klassen and Katherine Dilworth. Steve, welcome. Thank you for letting us interview you today. Um, I thought we might start off by just talking a little bit about your life even prior to Purdue, just to set some context. So I was wondering for the record if you could state your full name with your, with your middle name and also tell me when and where you were born. Uh, Stephen Wayne Leininger. Uh, I was born May 28, 1952, uh, Rochester, Indiana, and my grandfather delivered me. Oh, that sounds like an interesting story. Yeah, he, he, he was a doctor, so he... <laughs> so he had the credentials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so prior to college, where did you go to school? Uh, my, uh, we, we lived in South Bend, so I uh, went through the fifth grade, I believe, in uh, 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 South Bend, uh, South Bend schools, and then uh, we moved down to Indianapolis. Okay and uh, continued on school there, went to North Central High School in uh, Indianapolis. Great. How did you decide to attend Purdue? Uh, part of it was economics. Uh, uh, state school is uh, much less expensive than, a, oh, yeah. uh, than other schools. Um, I thought I wanted to be a guitar amplifier designer. Really? Uh, I, I, I worked in a... Uh, uh, music store. I had worked in a music store since my senior year in high school uh, doing electronic repair. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'd, I'd been in, into electronics as a hobby uh -huh. before I got to school and uh, having worked in the music store I thought I was going to be you know the next greatest guitar amplifier designer. Nice. So you probably knew a little bit about some of the classes that Purdue offered in electrical engineering, or did you not have a Yeah, you, you know, really, I was pretty clueless. Uh, uh, I mean, it was a matter of picking an electrical engineering school, and of the ones that were available, uh, you know, University of uh, Illinois uh, would have been another choice. But, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, back then, and I don't know if this is common now, but... Uh, Back then, people didn't think that that far away, for one thing, yeah. or that far ahead, you know, uh, uh, not necessarily looking at the list of um, other schools, you know, the Stanford's, the MIT's, the other uh, engineering schools, and still probably would have picked Purdue because of, uh, the, the, you know, I thought I was going to go into, you know, electronics. Um, I... Uh, 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 was in a scouting group, a uh, uh, explorer post, um, especially explorer post at RCA down in Indianapolis that did electronics. So, uh -huh. uh, uh, you know, I even pursued that before I got into school. And I guess maybe some of the people that I uh, uh, met at RCA had worked at or had gone to Purdue. Okay. Yeah, you know, it was electrical engineers. So you were a musician. A uh, garage musician, uh -huh. but 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 certainly interested in the electronic aspects of music. What what um, attracted you to working with electronics? Uh, my mom got me a, an electronic kit in the oh. when I was uh, uh, in the third grade, uh -huh. and it was from uh, I, th I think it was like from the Metropolitan Museum or something like that. Uh, she used to get me all sorts of different kits. And this particular one had a battery and a bell and lights and switches, but no instructions. Oh. And so I had to figure it out. It wasn't like some of the, you know, uh, breadboard kits that Radio Shack would sell or something like that. This was, you know, you had to use a screwdriver to put the wires on and all this. And so I, I learned that if you put the wire across the battery that it heats up really hot, <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, various things about the switches. And so by the third, in the third grade, I was doing show and tells on, uh, on electricity. Wow. Neat. That's really amazing. So it sounds like your mom had a, had an influence on your... Big influence. Career. That's, that's fantastic. So where did you reside? Um, let's, let's kind of skip to you coming to Purdue. Did you stay in one of the dorms or... Well, when I, uh, the, the first year was, uh, down at, uh, uh, 
the the campus in Indianapolis. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. Uh, UAPUI, as everyone called it. Yes. IUIPUI, for those who are transcribing. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, I went there, and that's where I had my uh, uh, first uh, uh, use of computers. Oh. Uh, we had a uh, IBM 360 that we actually loaded the stuff into the machine, and it had a typewriter for the I.O. I mean, it wasn't even the, uh-huh. the big line printer or anything. So uh, uh, I got my first taste of programming there, and it didn't quite, it, it was okay. Uh-huh. It was enough that I decided to take at least another programming course when I came up to campus for my second year. Uh-huh. And I stayed at Cary Quad the first, uh-huh. first time, so, uh-huh. uh, uh, which of course is an interesting classic place. Yes. Um, um, you know, my my memories there are, are basically a, a relatively small room. Uh-huh. Um, we, uh, um, let's see, uh, I like the lunches. People would complain about them. I like the lunches because uh-huh. you, you get soup and a sandwich, and it was just like perfect. Yeah. And I remember that there were a couple TV shows that we used to all go downstairs and watch together, you oh, know, so that was fun. Um, uh, most of my time, though, one, once I let, you know, except for coming back for lunch, most of the time I spent over in the electrical engineering building. Okay. And uh, uh, as I went through my three years on campus, uh, I would spend most of my time in the electrical engineering library. Oh, uh-huh. Which was a rather modest library, uh, had a bunch of Older books that uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure they've passed away by now. But 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 uh, uh, the thing I enjoyed about it, in addition to being right there where all my classes were, uh-huh. was that I could uh, um, uh, I, I would look at the magazines, the uh, the trade journals, and if it weren't for the trade journals, I might not have gotten involved in uh, microprocessors uh, as early early as I did. Uh, there was an issue of Electronics Magazine that had the Intel 4004 on the front cover, and uh, which was their first microprocessor. And uh, this was after I'd already, must have been beginning of the senior year, or my last year. Uh, uh, I got through my master's degree in four years, so you mm-hmm. know I'd go through the summer, that kind of stuff. Um, unlike my kids. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, the, um, uh, the, uh, any, I, I read, a, I, I'd already taken some computer architecture classes, so I understood what was going on inside the chip. It, it was, it was interesting to have enough pre-knowledge of what's going on to look at this and say, oh my gosh, it's got most of the parts already inside uh-huh. this chip. It didn't. Uh, it's not like today where you'd have the memory and everything else in there. But, but the the actual processor uh, was already in there, and they described it. And this was an article that I understood entirely. I go, uh-huh. oh, this is this is cool. And uh, I, I wrote to Intel. I, I almost never wrote. You can ask. Uh-huh. Uh, you can ask my mom. I mean, she's got everything I've ever written and it's not a big pile. But I wrote a letter to uh, Intel and said, I'm really interested in your 4004, you know, uh, uh, microcomputer. Can you send, send me the technical book on it? And they said it was like $20, $25. I said, I'm just a student, I can't afford that. <laughs> so they sent me that and they sent me their newer one, the 8008, 8-bit processor. Uh-huh. And, uh, and, and, Without you know, without charge, and, and one other book, which was kind of interesting, but uh, they had enough detail in the eight thousand eight uh, technical guide that I was able to simulate the thing down to the register level. Uh, uh, we had another uh, another one of the students had done a, a, a simulation program, a general purpose simulation program, and they actually used my work to to verify that his thing worked right, you know. So so I simulated the entire operation of the 8008 so that we could actually run programs on it. 
which was kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't. It certainly wasn't in real time, but but you know we could show that the math, and the logic, and everything else was working. So at this at this stage, had you seen one in real life mm -mm. yet? No, you no. were simulating it just based on what you'd learned from. I was simulating it from the data book. Wow. Uh, and, 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 but but you know when you get that first page back from the computer that shows that you've added two numbers together and got what you expected, mm. you know, mm -hmm. or that you've added two, you could actually do decimal arithmetic, which is, it's, it's always a chore. You can ask someone who's doing the, doing that today, you know, yeah. you, uh, but we, uh, uh, so, you know, it, it verified that his program worked because I was able to, you know, follow his instructions and set up uh, my data deck correctly, but then it also showed that I understood the, you know, step by step, you know, this is what the yes. computer is doing kind of thing. That's amazing. Well, how wonderful that Intel just went ahead and sent you. Yeah, yeah, nice. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and in fact, I interviewed uh, with them when I got out of school or when I was getting out of school, and uh, I didn't have the semiconductor process uh, background that they were looking for. They uh, They generally took people from Stanford or Cal Poly oh. because they they were doing uh, 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 semiconductor processing there. Oh, okay. And, and uh, uh, so I didn't have that. They, they said, but boy, in six months we could use you. Well, <laughs> you know, you don't wait six months to get your first job. So I ended up uh, getting a job down the road at National Semiconductor. So when you were in your, your four years at Purdue, you said it was kind of towards the end of your time here when you discovered the, these readings. Had, at what point did you kind of decide, I want to work with computers? Well, in my junior year, I had to take, a, um, had to take some other electives within the electrical engineering department. Mm -hmm. And so I took a, a course on binary logic digital logic, okay? Uh -huh. uh, fundamental digital logic. And uh, people were having a very difficult time with this course. And it, it was like, it was like I, I knew this language all, all along. I, I knew what was going on there. Uh -huh. And uh, part of it might have been because I'd already taken the Fortran courses. Um, I had done a uh, science fair project in high school, junior high, on, on binary, binary operations. So mm -hmm. I'd, I'd done, you know, I, I knew enough of, about it to at least understand the fundamentals, and the rest of it was easy, yeah. you know, for me anyway. So uh, uh, this was in the beginning of my junior year, or the thir third year in school here, second year on campus, and, oh, this is, this is good. You know, what else is there? That you know, mm -hmm. uh, I've taken this course. What what was that a prereq for? Well, it was a prereq for computer architecture, and so I took that, and I took uh, an assembly language course in the computer science department. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, computer science and electrical engineering were two different uh, 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 disciplines. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so I didn't I didn't have to take the COBOL and you know, the business-related stuff, which okay. was computer science was more of a business service kind of mm. coursework back then, or at mm -hmm. least that's, that was the way. It, it wasn't at all part of the electrical engineering thing because except for the computer architecture part, we didn't have anything that really, mm -hmm. you know, played into that. Um, but, uh, you know, with the simulations and all this kind of stuff, we were starting to drag ourselves over there. Yeah. And... You know, you have to understand that when I when I did the uh, uh, computer logic courses, we were doing stuff on uh, boards that had discrete computer logic, actually made out of the transistors and resistors. Uh, the uh, uh, integrated circuit was just coming online at that time. Oh, uh -huh. So, uh, um, you know, to make something that added uh, two numbers together, you might have a whole you know, several foot by several foot kind of panel with wires and all this. Uh, reliability wasn't very good, and certainly uh, speed wasn't even something you'd think about. Mm -hmm. And so uh, as people started going towards integrated circuits, uh, 
you've got a level of abstraction that you don't need to know anymore. You don't need mm -hmm. to know how the transistors work, which kind of kind of changes the way you do electrical engineering. Someone needs to know. Right. You know, it's like someone needs to know how the transistors work. They need to know the physics and the geometries and all this. Mm -hmm. But that becomes a specialty. At a certain point, you know, you've got people that do processing and the physics and the size and the materials, all amazing stuff, but you, you can't do it all. Right. It's kind of hard to know how the entire... Well, it, it's good to know most of it. And too many people maybe don't know deep enough. Uh -huh. um, I found that with programmers when I started working at National Semiconductor, that someone that didn't understand what the processor was doing, how, how it made its decisions inside the thing, weren't the best programmers. Oh, interesting. And so I was able to put in to 4,000 bytes what someone who was software trained still had it like 6,000 bytes. <laughs> that was important back then because memory was very expensive. Uh -huh. Memory's not near as expensive now. We've got, you know, half a gigabyte uh, memories in the chips that go into the phones, for example. It's astounding. It, so, so it's a different level of abstraction, but and it's, sort of, it's sort of a moving thing. You know, mm -hmm. we, 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 we see things moving. Um, now a lot of the programming is done in C or C++ or mm -hmm. probably other new languages. Um, and that becomes the new level of abstraction. Um, you know, you take a common architecture. Uh, phones now either are the Apple architecture or an Android architecture, mm -hmm. and uh, you only need to understand it at the operating system level, unless you're designing phones. So someone needs to know this stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, uh, so I was very lucky to get in before they had operating systems and things like that. I mean, you know, you kind of end up writing your own operating system if you're doing something. Uh, in the case of, uh, uh, I was doing development tools at National Semiconductor when I first got started there. Uh -huh. And I was a kid right out of school. Uh -huh. You know, we had people who were more experienced with the semiconductors and all that working with me and, the, you know, who had done the architecture and things like that. But uh, uh, my skills in drawing, uh, 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 and doing logic design, mm -hmm. you know, doing schematics and all that. Uh, I was able to get a good start mm -hmm. in, in what I was doing uh, there. Now, um, you know, we, we did most of our, we did all of our schematics by hand, hand drawing them back then. Oh. Uh, this is before they had, uh, it's a graphic program called Schematic Capture uh -huh. that uh, uh, people use now. And... Uh, um, so, you know, I, I was at the end of that, you know, manual drafting kind of thing. We, we would draw it up and then someone in a drafting department would draw it up with pen and ink and all this okay. kind of stuff. Stuff you wouldn't do today. <laughs> so, uh, it was very interesting because we were a lot closer to, you know, what's actually in the thing. Uh -huh. um, uh, the speed of the electronics was a whole lot slower. So. Uh, uh, printed circuit board design was simpler. Um, the speeds that we're going at now, uh, like, like in your uh, phone there or in the laptop, um, they are at speeds that we would have called RF or radio frequency, you know, that, that well into the radio spectrum. And you have to deal with stuff a little bit differently sometimes. I didn't learn that, okay? but. I don't need to know that because I'm not designing those boards anymore. I'll use a board that someone else has already designed. Okay. But someone needs to know, you know, uh, again, someone yeah. needs to know that. So um, things that we didn't need to know that you need to know now include things like user interface design. Uh, you, you know, every, every some applications, you, on a phone, for example, or, you know, you just use it, and you know you don't have to think about it. And then some, it, it, it was a little bit like turning on the uh, on the digital recorder. There, you got this list of instructions: right. do this, do this, do this. Do. Other, otherwise, you spend an hour and a half, and 
I don't have anything. You know, the, the, I thought the light was blinking, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Okay. Well, so it sounds like um, you did have some classes that maybe had, com did they have computers in the room? We had, uh -huh. uh, we had computers. Um, um, we had a uh, PDP-10, which I think was a big screen interface hooked up to a PDP-11 or PDP-15 in the electrical engineering building, uh -huh. okay? I never got quite to where I was doing the software on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but those, you know, we had a computer lab, and it was like, like right when you walked in, you used paper tape and high-speed tape or something like that. Uh, my projects kind of veered away from that. I did have a pre professor that wanted me to do my simulation, uh, uh, my, my master's thesis was on uh, a uh, uh, decompression calculator for air breathing scuba divers. Oh. And, uh, and it was, it, the decompression computers they sell today are basically that device uh, with a slightly different, you know, you know with the economies of, uh, uh, of the chips that we have today. Uh -huh. um, so I probably invented that. Wow. Yeah, you know, uh, the, the problem was that uh, uh, the microprocessors of back then, uh, 1974, required two or three voltages on them. So the power supply becomes, a, you know, very difficult to deal with. Oh. Uh, so, uh, uh, but, so in the process of... Now, what was the question again? Oh no, I think I think you did. I, I think you did. I just basically was trying to get a sense of like when you some of these. Oh, oh yeah, classes, whether we had computers. Had in the room. We didn't have. You know, we we had the we had the the, the digital panels um, for for doing the adding logic and doing a simple ALU or arithmetic logic unit. Okay. Okay, and some of this stuff was. Uh, you know, done from uh, lab sheets, and some of it was, you know, you're assigned to do something from fresh. Okay. Um, I actually, uh, the, the uh, decompression calculator, uh, decompression computer that I designed, I actually designed the ALU for it because I designed it before I, I you know, I had access to anything that told me about microprocessors. Uh -huh. So it was right at the very edge of microprocessors happening. Well, am I correct in, in this? I mean, please tell me if I'm not, but to have the, the details and knowledge of the electrical side and, and I guess in some ways the hardware and then also to be writing software, what, wouldn't that have been kind of an unusual combination? It was very unusual. <laughs> well, see, and that, that, that's why the, 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 the uh, yeah, most of the people who were doing electrical engineering ended up at that point doing you know, logic designs and electronics. So, you know, electronic, uh, uh, what we call analog front ends, uh -huh. you know, so you, you know, you're doing measurement and stuff like that. All very important things, but it doesn't give you that general purpose computer that, you know, a personal computer is, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, it, 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 I was very lucky to be at the right place at the right time and, uh, uh, I was able to take the programming course on the CDC uh, uh, 6600. Uh, that was done with uh, punch cards. Okay. And uh, uh, used to go down in the basement at the uh, uh, Computer Science Building. I'm not sure which building that is now. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it's been gutted several times, but uh, uh, in the process of even being there, they brought in the electronic terminals. Uh, we had oh, uh -huh. TI terminals that would let you do this stuff, but uh, they weren't quite as reliable as the old IBM punch cards at that point in time. Uh -huh. They were still sorting some bugs out. So uh, uh, like when I did the simulation stuff, that was all done with card decks and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Um, um, you know, people kind of laugh when they hear about these things now, you know. It's, and, just, it's hard to visualize if you weren't there. 
But one of the things I'm curious about, um, because you talked about how computers were really used a lot for business purposes, did you or any of um, maybe the, the professors or students you worked with have any concept at that time of what else computers could be used for? Like, were you thinking maybe eventually people will use these to help with their own personal finances or with for entertainment? No, no, it, not at all uh, while I was at Purdue. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the, uh, the decompression calculator was, 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 that, was that, that, that was uh, pretty much a one-off mm -hmm. idea. Uh, about as close as things were getting, um, it was in my second or third year when the uh, HP 35 calculator came out. Okay. Um, the first engineering, first true engineering calculator. It was amazing. I bet. And, uh, but the we had a professor that, and I don't remember which one it was, but did a great job of teaching us the lesson that if you're given Two numbers that are that have uh, uh, you know three bit uh, uh, or three digit kind of accuracy. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get sixteen significant digits. You had to round it off. Okay. Uh, because it really you know a lot of people were still using slide rules. I remember when you couldn't oh, yeah. use the calculator on the test. Yeah. Uh, as I was the last year or two that ended up buying the picket slide rolls. I've got mine still. Oh, that's nice. Uh, uh, but the, uh, you know, certainly the, the, the calculators, the engineering calculators, made things a whole lot easier because, you know, math is math. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, and sometimes we say, oh, well, these kids these days can't use calculators. And really, you should still be able to estimate you know, if you're going through the grocery store, you ought to be able to estimate about how much you've got in the basket there. You know, mm -hmm. uh, do you have forty dollars in there? Do you have five dollars? Or, you know, if you if someone says that it's going to be this much, and you give them a twenty dollar bill, you should get you right. should be able to say, I should get a five and a handful of change back. You know, and if the computer's down, you've seen it before where people can't think. Anymore, so that's probably not Purdue's fault. That's uh, no, but it's, but, it's, it's accurate. But, but 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 you get to where your um, uh, maps are a great example now. Uh -huh. uh, I just saw where uh, AAA will no longer have their triptych, huh. and and so uh, if you're a transcriber for this, you need to look up triptych. It was, <laughs> it was nice, uh, but but uh, uh, you know. We, we, we have uh, uh, GPSs in our car or on our phones yes. now. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, my wife's got the last of the flip phones, I think, you know, uh, old school. But uh, um, there's so much in your phone now that, mm -hmm. that and, and I hope they're teaching that in, in engineering that every, you know, you should have a, cla a class in writing an app. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you should know if, if you've got a degree in engineering or computer science, you should know how to write an app. It mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't have to be exactly professional level or anything, but you should at least know the tools required yeah. to write an app because uh, it, it's, it's almost become a, uh, a colloquialism, you know, there's an app for that. Right. You know? How hot's my coffee? Well, there's an app for that. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got an app on my phone that I use to maintain my personal library at home. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, yeah, I could scan this barcode uh -huh. on the back, and it will look. It will bump up against four different databases. It'll bump up against Google, Amazon, um, the library thing, kind of library thing, and uh -huh. one other thing. Uh, and uh, uh, will tell me whether I've got the book in my library, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and which which I need when I go down to Vaughn's. Uh, yes. I, sh I should get a discount for this, but uh, anyway, uh, uh, I I have so many times seen a book that oh this is great, and well it's great because I bought it before. Right, and this keeps me from doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got like 
1,300 books in my own personal collection, and uh, uh, but it's all right on my phone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So everyone should have to write an app, you know, and some people may not be, you know, if you had a course in creativity, then mm -hmm. you have to come up with the app. Otherwise, it's okay to have a defined app, you know, uh, but you want to make it so it's not one that someone can go out and download from the internet, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, you, you have to learn how to think on your own. Yeah. Um, I didn't seem to have a problem having that structure at Purdue, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to think on my own. In fact, a lot of my classes were independent. You know, they, they had a scheduled time, but we really didn't meet then. You just had to be done with stuff by certain oh, time frames. I see. Um, uh, now, Diane was telling me that we have, that you now have classes that uh, are pretty heavy on teamwork and collaboration. Yes. An amazing thing. That, that's great. We didn't have that so much. Mm -hmm. uh, closest we came to collaboration was when uh, uh, Ada Kappa knew the electrical engineering honorary, uh -huh. uh, was planning our uh, uh, TGIF uh, uh, Beer parties down at the. <laughs> had to agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, had to agree on the venue, yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of that, um, I was going to ask you about what student organizations you were involved with and, and uh, honorary I, society. I was in Ada Kappa New. I was the president one year. Yes. Uh, I don't think I did a really great job on that, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, um, I hope they've picked up since then. You know, there's a lot of things that you could do now that, you know, we were back studying back then. Okay. And, and uh, but it was a nice comfy lounge. Uh, um, I was uh, Delta Upsilon for a year, the Unpledge. Uh, that's before they took the fraternity away from us, but that's a different oh. story. We, you know, it, it, it was like Animal House. Uh, <laughs> the place even looked like Animal House. It's the same white building and everything. Uh, and uh, uh, I so think this was Delta Upsilon House that you're talking about. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Uh, it it had been moved from Fraternity Road down to uh, uh, right on State Street, right at the top of the hill, and it became uh, something else after that. I think it was, I don't remember, another one of the fraternities, and they finally tore it down and made a parking lot or oh something. You know, goodness. you need parking lots around here, right? <laughs> yeah, well, yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, anyway. Um, uh, that was a that was a year that the fraternity didn't do really well. I mean, they mm -hmm. they didn't damage themselves, but but um, you know it was uh, it was getting near the end of the Vietnam War and lots of things were going on. You know, right. so people weren't weren't paying attention to things the way other things were going on. Well, that's that's a great segue into the next question, which is you know what was it like being on campus in the 70s, particularly like, were you starting to get a sense of um, sort of civic unrest or protests or? Uh... Uh, it was in the time of Nixon, and Nixon, uh, well, he probably did some great things, also did some extremely stupid things. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, yeah, I signed a thing to impeach him or something like that, you know. I don't know if you have rabble rousing on campus now. Uh, um, I don't think it's as, as visible. You, you know, uh, I, I, I know when I was there, the uh, the ROTC had some difficultish times. Uh, we, we were, uh, I wasn't in ROTC uh, uh, on campus, but uh, had been in high school, uh -huh. and, and had come up and, you know, uh, is the armory still the armory? Yeah. In fact, that's where they do the uh, uh, Rube Goldberg thing now. Yes. Yeah, so. Yes which I have not seen in person. I plan to come up and see that sometime. That oh, looks like yeah. fun. Yeah, definitely. You need to see that. Um, but, but, you know, it, it, as far as being aware of what's going on in the world, we really weren't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, I could, you know, I, I, I see that our kids, you know, my kids, I've got three kids, and... Uh, uh, grown adults, mm -hmm. uh, all uh, graduated from school, all have jobs, <laughs> uh, but they're not as politically aware, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and 
maybe while you're growing families and tending to a job, you aren't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I didn't have time to mess around with the poli politics stuff. I mean, I had, mm -hmm. the, had the TV show in the evening kind of thing, but... What was the TV show in the evening? Oh, I don't even remember. It, it, you know, uh, it, 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 it was a... It was a scary mystery something something. So I, I don't okay. remember. So something you were watching. Yeah, yeah, okay. like Dark Shadows or something. Uh -huh. You know, uh -huh. but but it was something that everyone watched. And you, it, do you remember the show uh, uh, Mystery Science Theater Three Thousand? Oh, yes. uh -huh. Well, that's exactly what we were like. You know, you'd sit there and you know you'd wisecrack through the whole thing. Oh, nice. And so it it, it was just a good time to you know uh -huh. let down. Uh, we used to show movies uh, uh, up up in the uh, uh, attic at uh, uh, um, uh, Cary. You can actually oh, get up into really? the attic at one time and show movies up there. Oh wow! Um, so it sounds like you had a good time with your your fellow. Yeah, the, yeah. The social stuff was fun. I mean, uh -huh. you know, uh, uh, we used to go to Arnie's uh, back then. You know, so I guess people still go to Arnie's for a pizza. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, I think it sounds uh, it sounds like you have spent quite a bit of time studying and reading and and those kinds of things too. But um, did you have a favorite tradition or custom at, at Purdue during your time here, mm. or was that just kind of not on your radar because you were studying? You, you know, uh, when when the I'd go to the you know always go to the football games, uh -huh. and uh, uh, of course we had a great football. We had you know. The Big Ten was the Big Ten back then. So uh, uh, usually early in the season, we would play Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. And usually we would beat Notre Dame, even though Notre Dame had a remarkable team most years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you could go to the Ohio State game and you'd almost for sure lose. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, of course, if you can get into the Oak and Bucket game, oh. uh, and, and do they still have the open bucket they game? Do. And, and yeah. um, my my wife uh, uh, was from IU, so I would get to see the game because you had tickets either as a student or her family had tickets down. Uh, you know, uh, when I go down for the game down there. So you met her while you were still a student. I met her when I was in high school, so we oh. were high school sweethearts. Oh, that's wonderful. That's and, true. And, It'll be, uh, we'll be married 40 years at, at uh, Christmas time. Well, congratulations. And you, you survived the IU-Purdue rivalry. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, uh, most of my family uh, went to IU. Okay. Uh, and, most, and all of her family did. So uh, I've got to be judicious when I wear my Purdue sweatshirts. I see, yes. Well, um, you talk, you started talking a little bit about um, working at the semiconductor business, but could you tell me a little bit more um, after graduation? What was sort of your next step? Um, let's see. I got I got the job before grad, you know, oh. the end of graduation. Uh -huh. uh, um, you know, they had uh, basically I spent the, the the last semester of school. Um, uh, finishing up my uh, uh, finishing up my master's thesis and uh, uh, getting interviews in, mm -hmm. and uh, so I in interviewed several different places. Went out to uh, uh, Rockwell oh. in uh, Southern California, and. Uh, 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 they were getting ready to start on the space shuttle program. So I could have been working on the space shuttle, which I probably would have enjoyed and would have done well. Yes. But uh, uh, I said I'm a real hands-on kind of person. I like uh -huh. to build things, you know. And they said, well, our engineers don't ever touch the soldering iron. We have union technicians here. Huh. And they told me this, like, early in the day, and I didn't hear a word they said after that. I mean, it's kind of like... You mean I can't, I can't do anything, you know? I, you know, and uh, so that didn't pan out well. But but uh, uh, ended up the uh, um, uh, 
interviewing with National Semiconductor, and uh, I interviewed two different groups there. I interviewed the, um, or two groups that I remember. Um, I interviewed the uh, calculator group, mm -hmm. and you would have thought that I would have done well with the calculator group, mm -hmm. but they had a different way of doing that. They, they had, uh, they used serial digital logic to do uh, the calculating because it was very efficient on the chip and everything. But uh, something I'd never seen before, mm -hmm. never studied before, and uh, maybe it wasn't the worst interview of my life, but it was, that part wasn't very good. Mm -hmm. But then I went to the semiconductor, or the uh, uh, micro, uh, microprocessor development group, and uh, interviewed with uh, three people there, and uh, they gave me an example, uh, 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 you know, write the, write the code to uh, add two numbers together. And so I asked a couple questions, well, do I have a carry forward on this and, and uh, a couple other things? And, well, assume that you do. And I, so <laughs> yeah, I, I wrote the thing, and they said, Okay, and uh, ask a few other things, and uh, you know it was enough like the uh, stuff from the Intel simulation that I I was I was you know aces on it, aces on it, um, and uh, so they hired me, and I moved out there uh, right after school. Uh, my brother and sister uh, uh, helped me load up a trailer, and we drove it, you know out to Silicon Valley, got an apartment sight unseen, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, ended up living out there for two years. Okay. So, so that, was, um, what, that was where you were whenever you first became involved with Radio Shack? Or yes, uh, I, I actually, uh, uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes things just happen. Okay? Uh -huh. Now, I had been working, uh, I'd been working, uh, uh, at National Semiconductor and uh, been involved in the Homebrew Computer Club. Okay. Okay, Homebrew Computer Club, uh, uh, not everything you read about it is exactly correct, but Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak were there uh, from Apple Computer. Uh, the guys from Crememco, uh, the thing was actually headed up by other, other folks. Uh, um, uh, but we met at the Stanford Linear Accelerator, uh, and it was basically a big geek fest. You know, just <laughs> just a bunch of people who were building computers at home. Yeah. And I was in the process of building a 16-bit computer at home. Uh, I'd already done the video board for it, and uh, uh, had uh, uh, I, you know, had the had a computer chassis from uh, from uh, uh, National Semiconductor at home and. There were some great surplus stores in the area where you could get equipment and everything. So, and, and we could get uh, whatever chips we wanted by just asking for them. You know, they were yeah. they were pretty generous in letting us do that. So several several of us were making computers, mm -hmm. and uh, I was uh, at the same time I was working on development systems and development cards. Uh, I designed three cards plus a whole development system and all the software that went on the development system because our software guys couldn't do it. But mm -hmm. uh, for, for an inexpensive chip, okay, this was uh, uh, less expensive than the 16-bit uh, uh, the, uh, the processors that they had. It was simpler power supply. It was headed towards where we are today, oh. okay? And uh, uh, simple, cost-effective microprocessor scamp, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I was working on that, and uh, um, the sales guy, uh, the sales manager, micro computer microprocessor sales manager, was either on a, another business trip or was sick or something or other, mm -hmm. and they didn't have anyone to you know, give the, the song and dance thing to. So I uh, uh, did, um, I came in and talked about the microprocessor and how it, you know, had just a five volt power supply and that uh, actually we, I was in the process of writing a basic 
interpreter for that, uh, the basic language, and uh, uh, didn't have it finished, but is in the process. Uh, in fact, the work I started with ended up getting finished after I left and published. But uh, so. I talked to uh, the, the Radio Shack folks were in, and generally they're in looking for new chips to sell in the store. And they were looking for ones, at that time they used to buy them out of spec, you know, so they, they were, uh, if they were LEDs, for example, they were ones that were either too bright or not bright enough. Oh. Okay. Uh, or chips that took a little more power than their spec was or something like that. Uh, which they changed in later years. They they got to where they were selling, you know, clean stuff. But uh, what else do you have to show us? And well, we've got this microprocessor because they had been working on a 16-bit. They had a consultant back in Texas that was doing a 16-bit microprocessor design using our 16-bit microprocessor. But it was a lot more complicated because it had more power supplies and things that. Uh, uh, you wouldn't do, but they were doing a microprocessor kit. And anyway, I showed them this less expensive one and how it worked. And here's the little board that it's on. And uh, can you put a, you know, can you do this and that? And well, here's what we've done so far. And so they were pretty impressed. Uh, and uh, John Roach, who became the chairman and chief executive of Radio Shack, he was the Vice President of Manufacturing at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he said, uh, are there any of those uh, uh, newfangled uh, computer stores here, uh, you know, somewhere local? And I said, well, yes, there's one down on, uh, uh, I think it was Lawrence Expressway. Might have been Stevens Creek. Anyway, no, it was on El Camino, uh, main drag, main drag there. It doesn't matter where it was, but it was Byte, Byte Shop, B-Y-T-E, shop number two. Huh. And uh, so it was the second computer store, and I'd been moonlighting there. Oh. So uh, I said, so I gave them the address of that, and um, they came, you know, they came down to visit, and here I was behind the counter rolling up a paper tape. And so they were a little surprised to see me <laughs> there, and I showed them what was there. And, uh, there was an Apple One. Uh, I saw that one of those just sold for a huge mongous amount of money. Um, um, and uh, there was a, uh, an Altair clone, which I, I also had one of those. Um, I was the only, it was, it was like getting the job at the music store. I got the job at the music store doing electronic repair uh, back when I was in high school. Uh, because I knew how to, you know, my friend's uh, uh, amplifier wasn't being worked on. And I said, well, can I go take a look at it? And looked at it with their equipment and got it fixed. So it was kind of like that with the, with the computer store. You know, they had an oscilloscope that was so old. I mean, it was, it was like out of a tank or something like that. And so it wasn't fast enough to actually see the signals on, on the computers we were trying to repair. So um, I had to you know, repair some of these otherwise. And anyway, so I was working in the store there and showed them around. And uh, uh, they asked me if I had considered doing some consulting work for them, you know, because they knew I knew something about this cheap chip and things like that. And I said, well, yeah, sure. And uh, um, I'm not sure that was within what I could legally do from National Semiconductor, but I was a kid and you don't know. <laughs> and, and so uh, I didn't hear, about, hear from them until about six weeks later and on a Saturday morning I get this phone call. And uh, one of the guys says, uh, we'd like you to come out here and see our facilities. Okay, well, you don't ask a consultant to come out and see your facilities. Okay, you might ha ask him to come and do something or something like that, but to see your facilities, that's kind of like code for, you know, we're looking for, looking to hire you. Right. So <coughs> my wife, we'd been married about six months at that time. She'd finished up her uh, uh, oceanography work at Texas A&M at that time. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, we got married and uh, came out uh, uh, to California and could not get a job. She was working the breakfast shift at McDonald's and was glad to have the job because uh, the USGS, it was a... Uh, election year and they had to lay people off because of budget things and stuff like that um, anyway so uh, they said well we'd like you to come out and see our facilities and since I read that as you know we're, we're, we're looking at possibly hiring you I said well I'd like to bring my wife along also which was unheard of <laughs> at, at, at Radio Shack there you know the they used to say, well, we're just simple country boys in the electronic business, and there was a lot of truth to that. Okay, They weren't of the level of sophistication of, as the, even the Silicon Valley, you know, the Silicon Valley ones back then were uh, uh, more sophisticated than that. And uh, so uh, I'll have to get back to you, and they got back to me and said, okay, you know, <laughs> just this once. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, we went out there, and uh, uh, she called her cousin. In the meanwhile, she had a cousin uh, who was uh, who worked for Chevron down in Houston, and said, "Would the job prospects be better in the Dallas Fort Worth area than they are uh, uh, out on the West Coast?" And he said, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah." For, for someone with your background, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we went out there and uh, they interviewed me through the morning and then made me the job offer at lunch, you know, um, said we'd like you to come work for us, gave me a, uh, a price, uh, price was, you know, or the, 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 the offer was like 20% more than what I was making. Mm -hmm. Texas had no income tax. California had a very big income tax. So, it, you know, oh, th this looks pretty good. All right. Now, uh, uh, when I told my, you know, family and friends that I was going to go work for Radio Shack, it was Radio Shack, you know. <laughs> so uh, it, it was, you know, um, they were pretty unsophisticated at the time. And, well, you know, They've managed to slip back into that and get themselves into trouble, but uh, uh, that's not my doings. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, they uh, uh, they made me the job offer, and I said, "Well, I need to think about this." So we went and drove around Dallas for a while, mm -hmm. and uh, after talking over, decided, "Well, yeah, the, the, you know." I, I think we should do this. So I called him back and accepted the job. Okay. And uh, we got we we moved there and got there on the fourth of July, nineteen seventy six. Oh, okay. So until the the lunch time when they made you the offer, you didn't really know what you were being interviewed for. Well, they they showed me. They they showed me the. the they said they wanted me to check check out the design and get it complete for this 16-bit computer kit. And, um, okay, I, you know, I've got the skill set to do this, mm -hmm. okay? After they hired me, I continued, you know, I had to study it in more detail, and as I studied deeper and deeper into it, well, parts weren't done right and things like that. And then the president of Radio Shack, uh, Lou Kornfeld, and he was not computer savvy, okay? Very not computer savvy. Um, he said, it can't be a kit. He says, uh, uh, you know, uh, pe people just won't, won't, get, won't get it. Mm -hmm. And so that gave us the opportunity to build the thing complete, but the, what, the way they were doing it was more like a development board. You'd still have to have a, a, a teletype or a, terminal, which were hard to come by it those days. Uh -huh. Well, I was already doing the video interface board for, for my own stuff, and I said, well, we could put a video on there and, you know, maybe put a keyboard on it. You know, we, I was already thinking in that direction, mm -hmm. but we couldn't put a surplus keyboard on there, you know, that had, you know, some intelligence on it. 
um, we had to take all the money out of the thing. They, they wanted to sell it. They decided they wanted to sell the thing for $500. We ended up selling it for $600, but we made like 40% margin on it at that price. And uh, uh, but I was, I, I was the only one that had the experience with the microprocessors. And so as, as we got further and further into it, um, uh, people didn't quite understand the design process that I was going through and would ask me to do other things like, you know, well, check this kit out or, you know, do a repair and all that. And it, it got contentious between me and my boss. Mm -hmm. And I, the guy had good intentions, but he had other things he had to do also. Mm -hmm. So they finally took me and put me in my own, they put me in, in the speaker factory uh, in my own room mm -hmm. and uh, so that I could do the, finish up the hardware and software development, gave me whatever materials I needed. Mm -hmm. I wire wrapped the whole thing. I made the, the first computer uh, I had wire wrapped. I still have some of the boards. Um, and uh, uh, we had contracted a guy to write the software. Uh, to, uh, there was a guy who had a piece of software running on a different microprocessor, and he was going to rewrite it for us. Then he quit answering his phone. And this went on and on. And, well, after the first of the year, uh, you know, I'd been there for six months. Uh, right after the first of the year, we decided we weren't going to hear from him again. Well, mm -hmm. Steve, you're going to have to write that. <laughs> and so um, I took a, uh, uh, there was a public domain basic interpreter out there that was written for a different processor. And I took it and converted it a little bit, and then between me and the guy who was working with me on the specs on it, Don French, uh, you know, if, I, if I'm the father of the TRS-80, he's the mother of the TRS-80. He, he, he was the guy in purchasing that, that went ahead and he's the guy that decided to do it despite being told not to do it. Oh. You know, he risked his job doing this. And I was having fun. So anyway, I ended up uh, uh, putting uh, a floating point in, into there. So I had to learn floating point arithmetic, which is a good exercise. Uh, uh, and I also did uh, uh, a, a tape recorder interface so that we could save programs and load programs because we didn't have any other way to do it. And uh, also to save data out there. And that wasn't at all in the programming language the way it was, so I had to make some modifications there. But in two, in about a month, I was ready to go on this. Wow. Got it working and was able to demonstrate it. Uh, in fact, it was on Groundhog Day, 1977, that we uh, showed it to Charles Tandy, who uh, uh, was the uh, chairman, chief executive, president, and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he, uh, he uh, looked at the demonstration. We had some little basic game on there that we were shooting, uh, 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 shooting stuff. I actually had crude graphics on there. And so it would shoot. And uh, uh, he, he puffs on his cigar a couple times and uh, blows his big ball of smoke into the screen and it kind of came up and <laughs> hit me. Oh. And he says, okay, I guess we can, uh, we can go for a sample run on these and walked out the door. <laughs> and all right, well, that, 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 that was yes. And so from there we, uh, 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 from there until, uh, you know, it was introduced in New York City on August 3rd 1977, same, mm -hmm. same year, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, they, uh, they took uh, several of us up, up, up there. Um, um, I was the only engineer with a degree. Hmm. Uh, uh, it's kind of funny, most of the other guys were hobbyists that they brought up through the stores. So, uh, you know, 
and there are a lot of engineering type of things that that they they didn't quite understand back then, you know, timing relationships and all this kind of stuff that I was able to make the whole thing work. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, uh, you know, so we went up to New York and, uh, uh, you know, did the tourist stuff, the Mama Leone's for Italian food and everything, but we were going to show the thing at the Warwick Hotel on August the 3rd, and we did. We had, we took uh, six units up there and they all worked. Uh, you know, that, that always amazed people. And, uh, well, what are you going to do with this? Well, you maintain recipes. And, you know, we had a whole bunch of, you know, we had this m list of things that you could do, uh, a math drill. But, you know, well, we didn't really know. Uh -huh. You know, like everyone else, we didn't really know. And the same day we introduced it, there was uh, some kind of bomb had gone off in New York. And so, all the news media was down there, and they kind of missed, missed our thing there. But uh, I had estimated that we were going to sell uh, uh, we, were, we, we, we had built the thing as if we were going to make 3,000 of them. Mm -hmm. Because if we didn't use them for anything else, we could use them for inventory use in the stores. Okay. And I said, you know, I think we could sell 50,000 of these things a year. And uh, uh, I was told uh, uh, that's nonsense. Mm -hmm. You know, we've never sold anything that expensive, that quantity. Mm -hmm. And I think I was like five thousand units short of the the real number. So, yeah. so, so, uh, you know, we sold an amazing number of them because mm -hmm. uh, the price was right, six hundred dollars with the recorder and the monitor and everything. Uh, the Apple II which came out about the same kind of horsepower, better case, better power supply, mm -hmm. better expandability, but it was $1,000 without the monitor. Uh, the Commodore PET had a horrible keyboard, mm -hmm. sold for about what ours did. So uh, they were all out there competing, and they all had sort of the same list of, these are things we do with the computer. Mm -hmm. That's before the first spreadsheet multi-plan came out, and oh. you know, uh -huh other his, historical things. So that's how, that's how the Radio Shack thing sort yeah. of evolved. It sounds like it really distinguished itself in the market by having the screen and being affordable. Well, yeah, and, and, and it was being, it, you didn't have to go to a computer store to buy it, you just go to Radio Shack. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, good. you know, we, we played that. Uh, some people uh, say that the quality wasn't as good, mm -hmm. but if, if you look at back then, uh, you could get a teletype that had the same keyboard as ours, uh, a glass teletype, or a, you know, CRT terminal, that did nothing but the terminal thing, and they were $1,000. Oh, wow. So, you know, uh, we were on the tail of the Altair. When it came out, it was $400, mm. and people said, well, the, the Intel chip cost that much. Mm -hmm. Well, it had come down in price, you know, when they came out with that, and... Uh, but it had like 256 bytes of memory, bytes of memory. Mm -hmm. uh, you oh, know, the, just amazing. incredibly small. Uh, you, you could get more boards for it, and I had a system that had more boards in it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, you know, uh, there was already basic for that. Uh, Bill Gates had oh, written that. Right. Yes. And uh, later on, Bill Gates wrote the level two and level three basic, or mm -hmm. his company did. Uh, uh, for the Radio Shack computer, which really took it to a much better step. Okay. His, his software was far superior to the software I wrote. Okay. But he, he was building on stuff that they'd already done for, mm -hmm. uh, for other companies. Right, right. Well, so what happened after this this the sales really um, were far exceeding expectations? Like, did you get a piece of any of the uh, profits? Or I, I, I got the largest bonus an engineer had ever gotten at Radio Shack at that time. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Uh, probably small by today's proportions, but, you know, I had a job and uh, um, uh, was able to do pretty much whatever I wanted. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, we started working on a business machine. Our, our business machine 
came out uh, well before the uh, uh, IBM PC. Oh, okay. And I remember going to a trade show and the IBM guys show up in their dark suits and everything. We, we had these hideous robin egg blue uh, jackets that uh, someone had gotten made for us. Um, <laughs> And uh, uh, we were showing our machine off, and our machine uh, was basically superior to anything that was out there. I mean, it was it was like a. Uh, I, I think it helped put Wang out of business, or I don't know if they're out of, out of business, but you know they they didn't respond quickly, mm -hmm. and our uh, 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 you know. It, it was well done. Yeah. And then uh, we did other versions. The, the Model 3 was the Model 1. Actually, the Model 1 wasn't the Model 1 until the Model 2 came out. You know, oh, I see. Which was kind of funny. The Model 3 was a uh, cleanup of the Model 1 because uh, we had too much electronic radiation uh, oh, wow. noise, electronic noise. Mm -hmm. And TI used that against us. TI, Texas Instruments came out with their computer, and they had experts in in, in dealing with uh, radio frequency kind of stuff. And so they were able to clean their act up a lot quicker than we were, and they convinced the FCC that we were being really bad. Oh, no. Which was partially true, but... Uh, uh, you know, they, they, they use their strengths as a tool against us. Mm -hmm. And so we had to clean things up, which we did. Uh, TI made some horribly bad decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, their bad decision uh, was, was to, when, when they came out with their personal computer, you had to do all, their soft, all your software through them. Oh, yeah. Uh, and their, ROM, their, their memory cartridges, they had to do the memory cartridge. They had some special stuff in there that you know, uh, you'd be violating patents or something, and they would go after you. So you had your choice of working with a company that would go af after you, mm -hmm. uh, unless you let them do it. And, and so is that a whole lot different than what we have right now with ink cartridges that you can't refill because they've got some sort of memory right. protection in it, or the new Keurig coffee. The, <laughs> you know, Keurig came out with their 2.0 coffee maker, and oh, well, you can only use cartridges from ours. The thing reads something, and it will reject, you know, the fill your own ones. And, and so, you know, it becomes, it becomes a self-punishing prophecy, though, when you do this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, people who do product development probably ought to take a course in, in uh, 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 consumer behavior, uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Stuff I learned in my psychology class here, I didn't appreciate until later on. You know, mm -hmm. you, you you learn that that uh, perceptions do actually become reality. You know, uh, right. it, it doesn't matter what it is; it's what your customer thinks it is. Exactly. Yeah, and the customer loyalty can be really affected by. Well, yeah, those kinds yeah, of and, and you know, it, it's like uh, Apple's got amazing customer loyalty. They'll mm -hmm. they'll do things that. Uh, just confound everyone else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me um, how things, I guess, progressed for you after this. Did you stay on at Radio Shack? I, st I stayed on for a while. Then they brought in uh, some management above me. I, oh, I was still a kid, and that kind of, you know, that kind of irked me. I thought, well, maybe I deserve this. Mm -hmm. And uh, this guy, well, he, even though he had a doctorate, you know, been a, been a professor, uh, been a uh, engineer at uh, TI. He didn't quite get it. Mm -hmm. There's an entrepreneurial mentality that mm -hmm. that uh, I know you probably teach in the Cranert School now. Uh, entrepreneurism, you know, yeah. and uh, you know there probably ought to be an engineering entrepreneurism course if there isn't. I haven't looked. But you know, the, the, there's a lot of exciting stuff out there. How, how do you how do you get from here to there? Mm -hmm. uh, well, a lot of it back in our days was a matter of not knowing that you really shouldn't be doing that. Uh -huh. And 
I'm guessing that if you look at some of the businesses today, a lot of it is, well, because you don't know you shouldn't be doing it. Right. Now, you know, there are other cases. Uh, the, the, the Uber model is a big model today. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of people, um, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the gig mentality or something like that. Uh, and that one's your basic upset the apple curtain. Kind of thing. It's not unlike what we did with the computers. Yeah. You know, it's a matter of knowing enough. It's a, and and you know, not 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 uh, not being afraid to be uh, uh, the David among the Goliaths. I mean, you know, uh, uh, we 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 uh, we had IBM just absolutely stunned mm -hmm. with some of the stuff we did. They were busy. Trying to protect their, you know, they they had terminals that cost more than our business computer. Mm -hmm. We had software that ran on our that you could buy for our business computer that would allow it to be one of these terminals. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you know, they they didn't want to damage their own marketplace, but someone else was doing it. Yeah. Uh, did we have to work with IBM on licensing? Well, sure we did. Mm -hmm. IBM wasn't a jerk about their licensing the way Apple is a jerk mm -hmm. about their licensing. Uh -huh. And that will come back to bite you eventually. Uh, Apple is now the IBM that we used to face. You know, they're, they're, the big do they're a big dog out there. And, uh, um, you know, when they make uh, dumb decisions or when they trample on people now, mm -hmm. uh, it comes back and bites them. Um, so there's lots of opportunities out there. Uh, you know, there are people that do uh, do watches better than, than Apple. I mean, mm -hmm. the Apple Watch is nice, but you have to have an Apple uh, phone. Mm -hmm. I don't. Ha I, I choose not to have an Apple phone, so the the Apple Watch doesn't mean anything to me. It should be a standalone anyway, right? It, sh yeah. it should be a TV and a phone already. I mean, Dick Tracy had one for crying out loud. Right, exactly. Well, it does start to feel like there's so many rules that you don't have the freedom to make your own choices. Well, you, you just have to be aware of what the playing field is, and mm -hmm. sometimes you can choose to upset it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't know enough to know that doing computers to do recipes and that kind of stuff uh, re really aren't a big deal. Mm -hmm. But, uh, uh, you, you know, that next great idea is out there. Yeah. And uh, um, knowing a lot about a lot of different things, you have to be a generalist and a specialist at the same time. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I, I was pretty well prepared from Purdue to do a lot of that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, when did it really hit you what a pioneer you were with? personal microcomputers. I mean, you must have realized based on the success of the sales that something important had been done, but you know, when, I guess, at what point did it really hit you how much groundwork you had laid for where things were going? Well, you know, we still thought we were just running along and competing. So, you know, it was maybe, it wasn't until after IBM came in and dominated the market that I'd look back and say, okay, uh, it was a pioneering effort. Mm -hmm. uh, Radio Shack had dropped the ball by then. I, uh, I worked for Radio Shack for three times. Uh, I, I quit at a certain point because of the, uh, I felt I was being oppressed by management. Went into consulting. Mm -hmm. Came back twice. Uh, I quit for the same reason the second time. Same guy. Mm -hmm. And the third time I came back to do... Uh, uh, do uh, a uh, website for them called uh, Steve's Workbench. And uh, it was actually a hobbyist related workbench. It was the, it could have been the beginning of the maker movement that we now have. Mm -hmm. uh, but Radio Shack didn't pick up on it. They, they were doing some of the right things in some of their product selection. Mm -hmm. But the people that were involved in that were consciously keeping me out of it because. I think they were afraid of my, I don't know, I don't know if it was the aura around me or mm -hmm. that, that, that I was pretty opinionated on some things. Mm -hmm. uh, um, one of the things Steve's workbench was doing was doing uh, uh, evaluation of products. And 
uh, of some kits we were selling because we had a whole bunch of kits that we were now selling that other people had made. Some of them were pretty good. Mm -hmm. And there was one that was just really not pretty good. And I had a thing kind of like the, uh, uh, well, like you see on TripAdvisor now, but you used to see on uh, uh, con Consumer Reports, you know, uh, uh, five, five bullets or whatever uh, on ease, ease to build, usefulness, fun factor, uh, quality. And there was one that was very hard to get it to work right, and the quality was really pretty shabby. So mm -hmm. it, it got a couple ones and a couple threes, mm -hmm. which is what it deserved. But the, the buyer was, was, was incensed mm -hmm. that I would, you know, uh, give They didn't understand how valuable un, honest feedback is. I, I, you know, I, they may have changed since then, but they scrubbed my site when they changed over to the, to a new version. Oh, uh -huh. and, and it's because they didn't understand that, you know, if you can't accept criticism, then you shouldn't be doing whatever you're doing yeah. because someone's going to criticize you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, not only, you know, and since I was doing the criticism, they didn't understand the value of trust. Mm -hmm. You know, the, uh, you know, if if you go to a Amazon thing, they'll show all the reviews, and if you, if you see that you know this thing really falls apart, or you know it's hard to use, or um, it costs too much to run, mm -hmm. that's very useful information to you. Yeah. Um, you know, you you go to a hotel site because you expect honest reviews. Uh, um, there's some sites where you can evaluate just the companies. So, you know, some camera companies are, you know, five-star companies. Some of these ones take all the accessories out and sell them back to you or something like that, yeah. you know. So, um, they didn't understand the customer trust mm -hmm. was more important than the rating on that stupid product. And that, you know, often people will still buy something, just not that one. They're not, it's not necessarily going to turn the customer completely away from you. It's just that one product that they That buy. one product might yeah. not sell very well because of what I said. Right. And the fact that they got rid of that before the maker movement started. I mean, if you think about uh, <clears throat> kids these days probably don't understand Radio Shack is where you used to do that. But, you know, you now go to Make Magazine or DigiKey, spark fun out of... Uh, uh, Boulder, Colorado, Adafruit out of New York. Uh, yeah. There's a new new age out there, and now that you can order some, you know, if you order something from some of these companies, mail order, you can have it here tomorrow mm -hmm. without paying extra for it. How does that work? You know, um, yeah. it seems like the people who are really taking <coughs> care of their customers are distinguishing. Well, and, and that's that, that's probably always been the case. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, uh, the guy that used to. You know, you hear about the, the country doctor. My grandfather used to be the country doctor. Would go out, take care of somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, he would accept chickens for payment uh, yeah. if, if they, they didn't have money, that kind of thing. You know, um, I'm not suggesting that's the way you need to do things, but, you, you know, if, if you want to be in business, your customers are pretty important. Absolutely. Well, Steve, that was my last official question, but I did want to give you some time to talk about anything else you wanted, wished I had asked about. Okay. Um, mm, 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 mm. I'll go back to the, the my library experience of, of reading the uh, trade journals. Yeah. Um, read all sorts of magazines. You know, leaf through them. If you don't understand them, that's okay. You'll be getting some knowledge as you go through it. Um, uh, I thought that, I mean, as, as far as my learning stuff, uh, that was a, that kind of puts you on the pulse of where things are. Mm -hmm. um, do things you like. Uh, uh, I took an electronic music course while I was here. Mm -hmm. That was fun. Uh, you know, we, we, we even took a field trip over to the University of Illinois, uh, which, uh, Great competition for here, you know. Uh -huh. uh, 
you know, they got the supercomputer center there. That's where the uh, browser was invented, you know, blah, 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 blah. So lots of good stuff going on there. Um, uh, learn, learn, to, uh, uh, learn to write an app. Mm -hmm. If you don't take a course in it, learn to write an app anyway. Um, think about what you like and don't like about things. Uh, user interfaces. Mm -hmm. Um, do you travel a lot? Okay, if you travel a lot, you'll end up in, you know, a number of different motels. And it amazes me how difficult you can make the uh, uh, temperature and water control on a shower. You know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, while we were on vacation last week, it took me five minutes to figure one of these out. You know, you got to stand outside and all right, well, I get, now I got water flow. Is this hot or cold? I, I don't know, you know. And so, uh, uh, user <laughs> yes, interface. You're an engineer and you have to figure out. Well, you, have, you have to think like other people. You know, you, you know, I'm an engineer and I'm having trouble with it. But that's, so, that, yeah. that's the point is if, if an engineer has trouble with it, then imagine the person who doesn't have that inclination to tinker, you know, with something. Imagine your mom doing it. Right. You know, so that, right. that, you know that, that's the example I always use. Imagine my mom doing something. And uh, uh, she's getting on in years. In fact, I came back for her birthday here. And uh, uh, she's got uh, Parkinson's, which also slows the mind down yeah. some. And uh, so sh stuff that uh, uh, should be easier isn't sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I was very lucky that the place I stayed in last night had the same remote control that I used for the TV as uh, the one at home, so that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but if you try to bring up the guide on some random uh, control, that, you know, that, that, that's a challenge sometimes. Mm -hmm. So uh, think about user interface. Think about what you like and don't like. Um, a gas pump that takes all your information and then requires that you press a start button before you can go to that next step. Well, the start button's not necessary. You've already mm -hmm. done interface stuff. You should just have to press the gas select and go. Yeah. Uh, not, not press the gas select and then a start button. You know, mm -hmm. that, but that does go back to some of the things you were talking about earlier where you know you were comparing like your software to others and they had way more steps and complication to it than it really needed. So I think that's, that's good advice for, for students, for sure. Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, learn about everything. Have some hobbies. Learn how to build things. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I kind of knew that before I got to Purdue. Didn't have as much hands-on building stuff at Purdue. Uh, you know, but I built my own guitar amplifier and stuff like that from scratch. Um, You know, you should take a course in building something if it's available. If it's not available, build something yourself anyway. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Steve. This well, thank been, you. This has been a lot of fun. I appreciate it.